This talk will begin by taking a walk from the south of the pier and heading north. Please note that we have used our own numbering system, which is different to the numbering now, but it is based on the property contracts that we have found. The first house, at the south end of the pier, is a house that has become known as the Harbour Master's House, which was sold by the States in 2010 for just over half a million pounds. It is called number 15 in the contract, and the States has owned the property for a long period of time. On this recent contract of sale, there is actually no history of ownership recorded, which is unusual. In this undated photo, the same building can be identified as Parks Naval Stores. On the sign it says that the store sells rope, paint and general goods. We believe this photo was taken between 1851 and 1861 when the store was run by Susan Park and her husband. Unfortunately, he appears to have died by 1861 and the business closed down, as in the census of that same year she is recorded as a 41-year-old widow living with her four children as a grocer two doors down further up on the pier. Often, in both the census records and photographs after 1851, this building is uninhabited. There is no evidence in the early census records of it being used as the Harbour Master's house, but in the 1935 almanac, it is recorded as the Harbour Stores and Harbour Master's Office. We've been told that acting Harbour Masters lived in the property in the 1950s and 60s. In 1952, the house was used as a film set for the film Toilers of the Sea, based on a Victor Hugo novel and starring Rock Hudson. The next property along I will call number one for the purpose of this talk, but it is more widely known as 14 Gory Pier. In the same photo as Parks Naval Stores, it can be seen as the Taunton Inn, with the name Cartwright on the sign. In the 1861 census, Joseph Cartwright, aged 42, a shipwright, is running the Taunton Inn with his wife Frances and their five children. The family continued to run the inn for many years, and in the 1881 census, Joseph Sr. has died, but his son Joseph is still living in the property with his family and his widowed mother. There are many photos from this period, which include the property and one of the nicest ones. This is a copy given to us by Ray LePivet of the Channel Island Family History Society. This shows Fanny Cartwright, Joseph's wife, outside of the tavern sweeping the pavement. Ray has identified the young girl in the foreground as Fanny's daughter Jane. Amazingly, this photograph was given to Ray by a relative of his great aunt, who had taken the photo herself which is unusual to hear of a female taking photographs at that sort of time. The photo was included in an album that she took with her out to China when she emigrated. When she tragically died there in childbirth, her widowed husband took the album onto New Zealand. It was retrieved from the loft in New Zealand and given to Ray, who brought it back to Jersey. The Cartwrights are not living in the property by the 1891 census. We have found a series of complicated property contracts detailing a dispute between Joseph Cartwright Jr. and another party who was contesting his inheritance. It appears Joseph lost, however, but the contract does record that the house was in existence as early as 1829. This house was also well known during the occupation years, where on the first floor the Germans installed a 3.7 centimetre anti-tank gun on a reinforced concrete floor. The steps at the back of these two houses leading up to the back entrance of the castle were known at the time as Cartwright Steps, presumably named after the Cartwrights and their inn. The next house along, number two, in the 1861 census was occupied by Mrs. Susan Parks, the grocer, who, as mentioned originally, lived and ran the chandlery in the harbour master's house. She remained in this house until at least 1901, still running a grocer's shop. It appears that she outlived her two husbands as she is Mrs. Park, widow, in 1861, then remarried to Philip Blompier in 1871, but unfortunately a widow again by 1881. The next house, number three, appears to have remained a residential house throughout the census records and was owned by Frederick Le Cellier, a mariner. The next four houses I will group together as they all at one time form the Elphine Hotel. It is first mentioned by name as the Elphine Hotel in the 1881 census where it was being run by Auguste Le Maire, a French sailor and innkeeper. Auguste also owned shares in the 24-ton cutter, named the Alphine, along with Edouard Perchard and Mr. Le Hooke, which in 1881 was recorded regularly bringing sheep from France into the harbour at Goree, and which presumably gave the hotel its name. We believe the original property of the Alphine, according to the 1881 census, was the tallest of the four houses with the extra floor. Auguste lived there with his wife, Euphrasie, and 14-year-old daughter, Emily. In the 1891 census, Auguste is still recorded as the publican, living with his wife, but by this time his daughter is recorded as being married, aged 24. In the St. Martin's marriage records, we were able to find that Emily married Reuben Ma in 1887. Shortly after their marriage, Reuben began to buy a number of properties on the pier. 
In 1892, he purchased the original Alphine property, number 5, Gorey Pier. In 1894, he purchased the house to the north, number 6. In 1898, he purchased the next property to the north again, number 7. Finally also, in 1898, he completed his property acquisitions by buying the remaining property to the south, number 4. We've not been able to trace where he managed to raise the money for these purchases at such a young age. In the 1901 census, Reuben Matt is recorded at the age of 38 as a hotel keeper and owner, along with his wife Emily, 34. Also living with them is Auguste Lamar, Emily's father. The hotel can be seen in many pictures of this era under the name of Maz Alphine Hotel and was eventually a place of some repute. Reuben sold the four houses under the name of the Alphine Hotel to the Jersey Investments Company in 1919, but the name of the hotel was in existence until very recent times. The restaurant Feast now occupies the two properties to the south, whilst the two properties to the north are now residential houses. Reuben died in 1937, a very wealthy man as evident in his will, where he left over £6,000 to various relatives and charities. He and his wife had no children. Whilst researching the hotel, we came across an interesting story dated 1908, when Reuben and his wife were running the hotel. We have recently catalogued witness statements to various crimes committed in Jersey, and we found such a statement written by Reuben Ma. To summarise the case, he states that he employed a woman by the name of Augustine Navarre Marie at the Alphine Hotel as a charwoman on Mondays and Saturdays for the last four years. Recently, the hotel had been missing quite a number of effects, which no one could explain. Another employee had told Reuben's wife that he had seen Augustine Marie taking flute from the hotel, as a result of which the parish authorities were informed. They decided to search Mrs. Marie and found her in possession of two pieces of soap and half a pound of tea, which she admitted to stealing from the hotel. She was arrested and then taken to her lodgings to conduct a search where they found, amongst other things, five pillow slips, ten tablecloths, thirty-nine towels, twenty-one napkins, forty-seven table knives, thirty forks, twenty-two tablespoons, twenty-two teaspoons. And that's quite a collection. She was immediately taken to prison, and her case was first heard in the Magistrates' Court and then in the Royal Court. She pleaded guilty on the 30th of May 1908, and was sentenced to six months in prison with hard labour, and then banished from the island for five years. What was she planning to do with these stolen goods? Open her own rival hotel, perhaps? Another interesting snippet that we have found whilst researching into the Alphine comes from the records for the Industrial School for Boys. The newspaper report of this event in August 1911 is attached to the headmaster's diary and reads, Yesterday afternoon, the staff on duty and the boys at the home were entertained to tea at the Mans Hotel Goree by Mr. Elias Collas. After an excellent meal, served up in a most satisfactory manner, to which the boys did ample justice, the headmaster thanked Mr. Collas for his great kindness for providing the treat, the second of its kind this year. Mr. Collas, in reply, gave the boys a few homely and practical words of advice. He was much pleased, he said, with their appearance and courtesy, and proposed three hearty cheers for the headmaster, Mr. Gavey, and the same for their other members of staff, both of which were loyally honoured by the youngsters. In return, ringing cheers rang out for Mr. Collas, and the boys filed out looking the picture of happiness and contentment. House numbers 8 and 9 were owned by John Francis Pico, a prominent local shipyard owner, who in 1896 leased them to George Alphonse Lestang, under the name of the Montorgay Hotel. Prior to this date, the houses had been known as the Café Francais, as you can see in this photo, and were licensed to Charles Lemaitre in 1883, until George Lestang took over the lease. The houses are now residential, as you can see in this photograph where they are painted blue and yellow respectively. In the archive catalogue, we found a petition for naturalisation lodged with the Lieutenant Governor in 1903 for George Alphonse Lestang. It records that he is a native of Charente, France, who had arrived in Jersey at about the age of five. He states that he lived in Jersey for 28 years, served in the militia for nine years, married a Jersey girl and produced a child. He further says that he has been running an inn for six years and has been granted a first category license in St. Martin for the inn. He would like to be an owner of property in Jersey, but he can't because he is classed as an alien and therefore would like to become a naturalised Jersey citizen. He presents with his petition a number of signatures vouching his worth including the Constable of St. Martin, centeneers from St. Helier and St. Martins, and an official of the harbour of Gorey Pier. Evidently, he was granted his naturalisation, as in 1905, he bought the next property along the pier, the British Hotel. The next five properties, numbers 10 to 14, were in 1892 owned by Francis John Cantell, and were collectively known as Cantell's British Hotel, some of which are now the Moorings Hotel and Restaurant. 
In the 1841 census, there are a few properties mentioned by name, but a Philippe Payne is recorded as a 30-year-old publican living on the pier with his wife Elizabeth. We found a contract for sale of this house in 1840, which records that the house was built between 1834 and this date. In the 1851 census, this property is named as the British Hotel, and Philippe Payne is still the hotel keeper, aged 42. In the 1861 census, Payne is recorded as the owner and innkeeper, but living with him and his wife is his niece, Anne Messervy, aged 28. In June of that same year, Anne Messervy married a mariner by the name of John Francis Cantell in St Martin's Parish Church. Francis Cantell, like Reuben Mare of Elphine, was an extremely successful property owner and hotelier on the pier. Baptised in Grouville in 1834, the son of Jean Cantel and Marie Fauvel, he was the eldest son of seven children. There are notes in Jean's book that suggest that Francis's father, John, came to Jersey in 1814 with Lieutenant Governor Sir Hillgrove Turner, but we have yet to find any proof of this. However, the extended family was certainly very involved in shipping, living locally at Gorey Pier and the village. Francis's elder brothers from his father first marriage were John and Mark Cantel, both of whom owned shipyards at Gorey and Francis's nephews George Gillies and John Matthew were master mariners who also owned properties on the pier and in Gorey village. We have found evidence in a contract dated 1863 that Francis John had worked in the gas as a master mariner. His wife, Anne Messervy, who was granted power of attorney whilst he was away from the island. He must have been away for quite some time, as in the 1871 census, Anne is recorded as the head of the household at the British Hotel, living with her uncle, Philippe Payne. Presumably, Francis's time away was very profitable, as once he returned to Jersey, he purchased a number of properties on the pier. In 1875, he and Anne inherited the property named the British Hotel from Anne's uncle, Philippe Payne. In 1880, he purchased a house named as 19 and 20 Gorey Pier, part of the property now known as the Dolphin Hotel. In 1881, Francis bought numbers 13 and 14, known as Nelson Place, the property to the north of the British Hotel. In this contract, it reveals that these houses were built between 1848 and 1857. In 1887, he brought number 17 Gorey Pier, which he later sold in 1905 to Philip Carell, which was called Carroll's Temperance Hotel, which is now the Sea Scale Hotel. In 1892, he purchased number 10 Gorey Pier. This purchase completed his ownership of the three houses we know as the Moorings Hotel today. It was during this period that the British Hotel became known as Cantel's British Hotel and is clearly identifiable in many photographs. We found this postcard, which shows Francis in his hotel, presumably at the height of his success. In 1905, he sold many of the properties presumably due to his failing health, and he died in October of the same year, aged 70. Like Reuben Matt and his wife from the Alphine Hotel, there was no children to inherit their property, and in his will, Francis left the houses numbered 19 and 20, now the Dolphin, to his wife Anne. He sold the properties 10, 11 and 12 under the name of the British Hotel in 1905 to George Alphonse Lestang, mentioned earlier, who ran the hotel himself for a time and called it Lestang's British Hotel. In 1911, he leased the hotel for nine years to Gustave Le Bordiac, and the hotel became known as Le Bordiac's British Hotel. In 1920, George Lestang sold the hotel to Ernest Gordon Trevor Ward Simpson. During the occupation, the southern end of the pier was closed and all the properties commandeered by the Germans. In 1950, the British Hotel was sold to a group captain, John Arthur Patrick Harrison, and for the first time was called the Moorings Hotel. Mr. J.M. Fitzpatrick bought the hotel in 1969 and completely remodernised it. The next few properties along the pier were all heavily influenced by the extension of the railway line, which opened on the 25th of May, 1891. The pier now became a destination for a day out on the railway or as part of an onward journey to France. As a result of this, many businesses were open to take advantage of this trade, mostly in the form of tea rooms and shops. The next two properties adjacent to Nelson House are currently Ingalil's Restaurant and Fountain Court. Ingalil's, number 15, was at different times called Montagai Tea Rooms or Singles Tea Rooms and was also a post office in the 1930s. In the 1911 census, Percy Single, a baker, was living at this address and operating the tea rooms. We found a series of postcards in the museum collection which could be purchased from Single's tea rooms as a souvenir of your day out. Fountain Court was known as Nelson House, also with tea rooms on the ground floor. In this particular photo, you can see a big advertising sign for Labelleister's Eau de Cologne on top of the shop, which presumably means it was quite a fancy shop at this time. 
We believe that this is where Nelson Square was situated, as mentioned in the 1871 and 1881 sentences, with an entrance to the houses from a courtyard, and where the stage horses could be tethered after their journeys. One of the people who lived at this address was Charles de Grouchy, whose occupation in the census record is recorded as a state's public weigher. Charles lived on the pier in this employment for over 20 years, from aged 50 to 70 years, and in the process outlived two wives. The actual way bridge was further along the pier, outside the building that is now the public toilet block. We've managed to find some documents from 1832, recording the type of goods that were being weighed on this way bridge. The ink is fairly faint on some of the records, but you can make out that their loads consisted of huge quantities of apples and potatoes, but loads of hay, rake, wheat and butter were also recorded. Unfortunately, it does not specify whether the goods are coming in or out of the port, but presumably apples, potatoes and butter were being exported and wheat imported. Here, you can see Mr. Champion bringing in loads of limestone, presumably for his brickworks at Five Oaks. The Weybridge was closed in 1933. Moving along to the next house, number 17, is the building we now know as the Seascale Hotel. This is a picture from a 1960s tourism advertisement brochure for the hotel, detailing all the services available at this time. Before this date, the property was known as the Seascale Cafe, as can be seen in this postcard, which we believe to be dated to the late 1940s. For many years, the property was owned and operated by the Carell family, and in the early days was known as the Carell's Temperance Hotel. Philip Carell bought the house from the peer's property magnate, Francis John Cantell, in 1905. He then left it to his son, Thomas Edwin Carell, in his will of 1938, who in turn sold it in 1955. Moving along, number 18 Gory Pier is the shop known as the Sale Loft. We do not know a lot about it, except from looking at contracts of neighbouring properties, it appears to have been owned by the Jersey Eastern Railway at some stage, and then was later owned by the public of the island, and therefore the states. In some of the photographs, like this one, it also appears to be a store or a shop at one time. After the gap, the buildings are numbered 19 to 22, which now make up the Dolphin Hotel. In the Taverna license books of St. Martin, which we hold in the archive, it records that it was first licensed as the Dolphin Hotel in 1947. In this photograph, you can see that number 19 was originally a residential house. We believe that the station master for Gory Pier, Winter Pershard, lived here. Winter appears to have held his position for many years, as he is recorded as the station master in both the 1901 and 1911 censuses. By coincidence, the railway closed in 1929, and he died later that same year. Number 20 and 21 can both be seen as cafes in this photograph, which was taken shortly after the arrival of the railway, number 20 being Marshall's Cadena Tea Rooms, and 21 being Stevens Eastern Railway Tea Rooms. Emma Stevens, who ran and owned Stevens Railway Tea Rooms, later purchased Marshall's Cadena Tea Rooms in 1921, and ran both of these under the same name of the Cadena Cafe until her death in 1935. She actually owned all three houses numbered 19 to 21. These houses changed hands a number of times until they were sold to the Dolphin Hotel Limited in 1941. The next house, number 22, was known as the Little House, as it was a very tiny single-story dwelling. In the 1935 almanac, it is recorded as Anne's Cafe, the Little House. In 1931, Annie Louise Lee purchased the house from Daniel Conway and ran it as a small tea rooms as well as selling jewellery and trinkets. During the occupation, Mrs. Lee evidently refused to leave the pier, but the Germans eventually allowed her to stay. There was some speculation that this may have been one of the oldest houses on the pier, but following the contacts back, we discovered the house was built by James Rathwell, who purchased the land in 1836. In this postcard, dated the late 1940s, someone has interestingly decided to transform the outside of number 21 and 22 into Tudor-style cottages. We have no idea who did this or why it was done, but you can still see the impact of this today. The next two properties along are now the Shop Neptune and the Café Louise, and as far as we can tell from the contracts, both were residential homes until recent times. I mentioned the Weybridge office earlier as being housed in the building we now know as the Public Conveniences. Looking back at various contracts on the adjacent property, this building seems to have always been owned by the state. This is another lovely photograph showing the Weybridge and other buildings. In the same photo, the young man leaning on his bike looks like he is a postal delivery boy, or perhaps a telegram boy outside of a house that makes the corner, which is now a diamond and jewellery shop. 
We have another photo of this building that shows it was at one time the Gorey Post Office, Telegraph Office and Savings Bank.